In section 1.6, we're looking at the mathematical treatment of measurement results. So remember, a measurement has a quantity and some unit as well as an uncertainty. And we're going to focus on the first two parts and how we can uh, use uh, this idea of dimensional analysis to approach calculations for these uh, quantities. So we're going to explain the dimensional analysis approach and we're going to learn how to use this to carry out unit conversions for a given property and computations involving two or more properties. The idea here is that whatever mathematical treatment we perform on some quantity, the units are going through that same math. So as an example, we've got the formula for speed which is a measurement of the distance per time. So distance divided by time will provide speed. And we see that if we know the distance, let's say a sprinter runs 100 meters in approximately 10 seconds, well, we can plug that into the distance 100 meters and time 10 seconds, and we come up with the number 10. But look at the units, the units, are meters divided by second or meters per second. And so the units went through the same division that the quantities did. All right. We can also take that equation and rearrange it for the solving for time if we're given the distance and speed. In fact, in any equation that relates three, uh, three quantities, if we know two of them, we can solve for the third. In fact, you know, if we knew the time and the speed, we could solve this as distance and solve for the distance, which would be the time multiplied by speed. And the units for time would be seconds. The units for speed, as we saw above, meters per second. Well, seconds cancels out and it gives us the units of meters. So really, as long as we're able to keep track of our units, we can make sure that we've done the proper calculations. This is what's known as, the, as dimensional analysis or the factor label method. Okay. This is based on the premise that the units of quantities must be subjected to the same mathematical operations as their associated numbers. And we can use this, and we will be using this throughout the semester in more complex multi-step calculations. Specifically, we'll be applying what is called uh, the fence post method, or is known in some, by some as the fence post method, where we can start off with some quantity. Let's say uh, here we've got five inches, five inches. Well, in order to convert inches to centimeters, we can use the conversion factor, this relationship of 2.54 centimeters is equal to one inch. So the way that I'm going to set up this type of a calculation would be say five inches and draw a post. So it looks sort of like a fence post there. And we would put what we know from the unit factor on the bottom in order to cancel that inches out. So we'll have one inch on the bottom. And on the top, we would put 2.54 centimeters. Our inches cancel out. And we see that once this calculation is performed, we would wind up with units of centimeters. Now, five times 2.54, I'm not going to do that right now, but all we would have to do here is multiply by whatever on, is on top and then divide by the bottom. So another way to write this would be five times 2.54 divided by one. In this table, we're provided with a list of common conversion factors, things to really uh, keep in mind or write down will be that relationship between inches and centimeters. Um, and then, uh, I don't know, I guess sometimes we will use 
pounds to grams throughout, but you can always just come back to table 1.6 if you're needing some of these conversions. You can also find them in the appendix. Uh, there's some in there, units and conversion factors of appendix C. Let's go ahead and look at that for a moment. We see units of length, units of volume, mass, uh, energy, pressure. What you don't see here are, is a conversion for uh, is a conversion for temperature. So let's go back to section 1.6. And this is because this relationship for temperature is not as direct um, in terms of just having this value is related to this value. For temperature, these scales are defined relative to a selected reference temperature. Two of the most commonly used are the freezing and boiling temperature of water, such as on the Celsius scale, where zero degrees is for the freezing temperature and 100 degrees is defined as the boiling temperature. And then the unit of one degree Celsius is broken up between zero and 100, just dividing it by 100 into 100 equal intervals. However, on the Fahrenheit scale, the freezing point of water is 32 degrees Fahrenheit and the boiling temperature 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So this does not allow us to have a conversion factor where we would just multiply. Instead, we have a linear relationship. This, this, uh, the, the relationship between these two scales is a linear one rather than a proportional one. So what we mean by linear is that it fits that linear equation, y is equal to mx plus b. In fact, the relationship for Fahrenheit and Celsius looks like this, or like this. They're the same relationship one solved for Fahrenheit, one solved for Celsius. So if we know the temperature in Fahrenheit and want to solve for Celsius, we would use the bottom one. This would allow us to go from Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius. This top one would allow us to go from degrees Celsius to degree Fahrenheit, but it's the same equation, just solved differently. And at that point, it's really plug and chug. In chemistry, a lot, and in physics, we use Kelvin. It's an absolute temperature, where it's an absolute temperature scale where zero is set to be the lowest temperature possible, where all movement stops or uh, the there's lowest a single state exists. And we'll talk more about that way later in the, in the text. But what we need to know at this point is that the relationship between Kelvin and Celsius, it's a little bit more straightforward than between Celsius and Fahrenheit, where it's just an offset. So to go from Celsius to Kelvin, we need to add 273. So that means the boiling point of water for Celsius is zero degrees Celsius, while in Kelvin, we just add 273.15. The, no, sorry, that was the freezing point. The boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius. We just add 273.15, and we get the boiling point in Kelvin as 373.15. What that must mean then is that a one Kelvin is equivalent to one degree Celsius, that they, they both are the same sort of length of unit of temperature, so it's not really length, uh, but the unit itself is the same, it's just offset so that the zero point is located at a different point on the scale. All right, well, that is it for chapter one. I'll see you in chapter two.